Stephen King, the chief global economist at HSBC. A very good morning to you. Morning. Uh, there you have Mrs. Merkel, Mr. Sarkozy, saying they're convinced that Greece will remain in the euro area. Are you? Well, they would say that, I and mean, they have to say that. There's no other choice at uh, this stage. Um, but the underlying problem is not specifically about Greece. It's about the structure of the euro itself, how it's supposed to work, um, and whether the different countries actually agree on how it's supposed to work. We had the example on Friday um, of Jürgen Stark walking out of the ECB, and in fact saying that he didn't want to see the ECB buying up more Spanish-Italian bonds. Um, and in those circumstances, you suddenly lose that kind of buyer of last resort for those kinds of things. You've got a debate about euro bonds. Uh, because um, although Barroso says it's a good idea to have euro bonds, the reality is that the Germans very much worry about the possibility of having to pay lots of taxes for other borrowers in, in the future. Because that would mean closer fiscal and political union, and of course it will also mean Germany paying the most money. Well, to be fair, I mean, the Germans lent large amounts of money in the first place. Um, in one sense, their loans created the crisis because um, they lent to the Greeks and the Italians and the Spanish uh, four or five years ago, remarkably low interest rates. So their loans contributed to the instability that we now see. So the Germans do have to take some of the burden. But the problem is we haven't got as yet any kind of proper uh, Eurozone-wide fiscal arrangement. There are some indications that perhaps countries accept that the very long term that kind of thing is required. But until it happens, the Germans in particular could be very much against the idea of creating Eurobonds. And time is running out so quickly. Do you think Greece A will default? Can there be an orderly default, whatever that means? Uh, well, you can have an orderly default of sorts if um, every party agrees to it, including the creditors in different parts of Europe. And we've had this kind of voluntary acceptance of loss from private sector individuals and uh, institutions over the course of the last few months. Uh, but uh, the, the broad story, I think, here is not so much what does Greece choose to do, but rather what do the other European countries choose to do about Greece. Their big concern, frankly, is that if Greece were to default or were to leave the Eurozone, it creates a sort of house of cards effect for other countries within the Eurozone. And once that starts to happen, you have problems not just for sovereigns, but also, of course, for financial institutions as well, as we've seen over the last few weeks. Bear with us for a second, because earlier we asked the chief economist of uh, IHS what would happen if Greece went down. This is what he had to tell us. I think in the end Greece will default, but probably within the Eurozone. Uh, it also benefits the Eurozone because once Greece goes, assuming they, they can negotiate it, uh, then the question is who else? You know, yeah. Where does this stop? And if Greece actually does default, do you think it can stay in the Eurozone? Uh, I think there's a legal debate about whether it can. My understanding is it probably c could stay in the Eurozone under those circumstances. But the, again, the big question would be um, how does the Eurozone itself cope uh, with a situation whereby you've got Greece defaulting and the possibility of contagion effects into other countries. And the underlying problem here is what is the responsibility of the debtors within the Eurozone and what's the responsibility of the creditors? And as yet, we haven't got any political answer to that at all. And what about the European Central Bank? For how long can it continue buying the bonds of some of the more peripheral nations, as well as Spain and Italy, of course? And we've got to take a closer look now, surely, at its balance sheet. Well, ultimately, the balance sheet of the ECB is supported by the European taxpayer. So in that sense, there is a kind of fiscal arrangement of, of sorts in place. Uh, but the, the question, in one sense, is to what extent are the German members of the ECB happy with the idea of the ECB buying government debt uh, when they're fearful of the possibility of so-called debt monetization, the idea of printing money that might lead to inflation? Uh, but uh, in the short term, at least, it's the only option that's out there. There's no other federal arrangement within the Eurozone, so consequently the ECB has to play the role of being buyer of last resort for these kinds of bonds. If it doesn't do so, um, and traders recognize that it's a one-way bet of continuous increases in these bond yields, then life becomes extremely difficult for the uh, Eurozone. But how do you see the timing of everything that's playing out? You do get a sense that perhaps we're now entering a new, perhaps the most dangerous phase that we've been in the sovereign debt crisis thus far. Well, there's a short-term solution, which again is this issue of the ECB buying bonds, but there's a long-term solution, which is the creation of some kind of stronger political and fiscal union. But that's it, not going to happen any time soon. Absolutely not. But there's one way you could do this, which is to have a timetable towards some kind of fiscal political union, in the same way that in the 1990s we had a timetable towards the creation of the euro. If you have a timetable, at least it gives an indication to markets that something will change in the future, and there's a political commitment to that change. At the moment, there is no sign of that political commitment, and therefore the uncertainty just get greater rather than smaller. I just want to take a look at the emerging markets, and to find out to what extent some of these emerging markets have an immunity to actually what's going on in Europe and to a certain extent in the United States as well.
They have done for a number of years now, actually. China's been growing quite happily at 9.5%, uh, a little bit too strongly, in fact, because it had a bit of inflation recently. Um, India's done very well. Latin America's done very well. Um, and one of the key differences is that uh, the emerging nations haven't had to go through this nasty process of deleveraging. They didn't build up huge amounts of debt in the first place. So if you offer the world economy extremely low interest rates, the emerging nations tend to outperform. On top of all that, you've got a lot of structural reasons for uh, strong growth. You know, China's catching up for hundreds and hundreds of years in one sense of lost opportunities. So lots of drivers for emerging market success. Well, they're nearly 100 years because they Maybe. were the biggest economy, weren't they, in 1820? <laughs> they were the biggest economy, but not necessarily the richest economy. Okay, think, kind of okay let's, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the actual pertinence of, of right now. Because you mentioned Latin America, and it's very interesting, but you must have great worries, both of you, I suppose, about Latin America, notably about inflation. I mean, look at Brazil, for instance. Well, Brazil's uh, had a significant rise in inflation, and the interesting feature recently is they've cut interest rates even though inflation has been on the rise. Of course, what the Brazil is assuming is that because of the global slowdown, maybe weaker commodity prices and so on, it's going to actually have a tempering effect on inflation. But it is clear that in Latin America, uh, the big shift that's taken place is a bigger concern now about growth rather than inflation. And the question for markets is, does that mean that actually not focusing on inflation anymore, which creates bigger concerns longer term, or is it simply that the weaker growth short term leads to lower inflation later on? Stephen, I want to take you to something that you actually wrote about in the Financial Times, economic permafrost in the West. We've talked oh, about yes. emerging markets pulling their weight, financial liabilities in the developed world too big for their systems. Talk us through what you mean. Well, the problem in one sense is that if you look at um, the Western world, um, they've built up these large amounts of um, assets and liabilities uh, based on a future level of income which now looks less likely to materialize. Uh, so the big question here is, if it is the case that you've got these very high levels of assets and liabilities, do they then have to fall in value? If they fall in value, uh, who accepts the burden uh, for that? Do you have a burden-sharing process between taxpayers, recipients of public spending, asset holders, debt holders, etc., etc.? Okay, we've uh, been speaking to a number of corporate heavyweights over the past 24 hours, notably in the World Economic Forum, about this sort of global shift. And the boss of the world's biggest advertising agency says that's uns. Stoppable, and the future is in their hands. We were going to play you that, but uh, can we play you that? We have got that now. It's not in song. The Chinese already own about 4% uh, of Italian bonds. Uh, maybe they'll buy some more, and maybe they'll, they'll bail us out. And I thought it was supremely ironic. If that was ironic, this is supremely ironic, that it is now the Brazilians leading the BRICS finance ministers <laughs> in a conference in a few days' time or a few weeks' time to bail us all out. So... Uh, our future is in their hands. Our future is in their hands. Is that worrying? Well, it's not so much worrying, it's just a reality. Um, <laughs> whether we worry about it is another matter altogether. There is obviously a concern, which is that we're seeing a shift not just in terms of economic power, but also political power. Um, and we have Western democracies, we have an authoritarian China, um, and so there's a clash in one sense of cultures and of political systems, uh, which does raise some really big questions. If, for example, the Chinese start to own large amounts of Western assets, uh, what is the corporate governance of um, the Chinese investors? Um, how does that differ from what is ha happening in the West? Do we move towards a new brand of what you might describe as state capitalism, where the interests of commercial enterprises and the state itself are much more blurred than might have been the case in the past? All those kinds of questions crop up. Uh, Linda, I was going to ask you about China's involvement in all this, because the market certainly were buoyed a couple of days ago when there was some talk that China was going to come in. Wen Jiabao put the dampeners on that to a certain extent yesterday. So what are the Chinese interested in? Clearly not debt. Yeah. But assets. Well, this is actually interesting, Owen, because late yesterday we had another headline. I don't know if you saw this, Stephen, that the NDRC, the National Development and Reform Council, the vice president there said they are interested in buying the debt of debt-ridden nations. And that actually gave the U.S. stock markets a slight boost. But, Owen, you're right. There's a very conflicting sort of message coming out of China. And I think in many ways this is the difficulty of dealing with a country like China. It's clearly not going to be a responsive uh, government, and that means we often find it hard to interpret what they actually say. Very finally, Stephen, losing control, what does the West need to do, given the Chinese reality of coming over? Well, I think what the West has to do is to, in one sense, grow old gracefully. Um, we have um, you know, extremely weak growth. Uh, the baton of global growth is being passed somewhere else. The important thing to do is to avoid the West succumbing to protectionist pressures. That's really the big danger currently. Okay, Stephen's we... book, Losing Control. That's okay. a nice plug. Thank you. <laughs> Stephen King, thank you very much indeed.